We're just ensuring that the recording is set up. Okay. All right. Well, welcome to the November uh, Drupal NYC meetup. So excited to have you all here. Um, my name is Mai Irie. I'm uh, standing in as a stand-in MC. Usually, Alex is the one who does this. Uh, but I'm doing it in the last minute. So uh, first off, I'm going to talk about some housekeeping stuff. Because we're recording, please mute your devices. Um, also, um, during the Q&A period, uh, please wait until we bring the mic to you. Um, that will help um, just so that people in the room can hear you, but also that your question is ca uh, captured on the recording as well. Uh, restrooms. So. Women, sta middle stage left hallway. Um, the gender neutral um, restrooms are middle stage right hallway. Same for the men. So we're just going to have some talks, some closing remarks after these announcements. And then we're all going to head over to um, Bill's Bar. Uh, and burger for um, an after party that's sponsored by Fastly. And so let's get to today's talks. So we've got a lot going on today. We've got um, um, three kind of longer format talks and one lightning talk. So first off, we're going to start off with um, we're going to start off with some rest stuff. So how to consume services in D8, and then. Uh, present that in the theme layer. Um, we're going to get into some basic uh, Linux stuff that's going to talk about um, you know, the basis for containerization. Um, that's like a term that you've probably been hearing a lot about. Um, we've had talks in the past on like containers. Um, this is more of like kind of like an intro. Uh, then we're going to get into a Square Connect um, module that integrates with Drupal Commerce. And then finally, um, close out with um, the state of City CRM. So thanks to our organizers here. Um, if you're ever interested in helping out, like definitely come talk to us. We'd love to have people help out or um, help us do some outreach for speakers. Love to um, have you be a part of it. And also, we want to thank our sponsors. So this particular venue, the food and the drinks in the back, are sponsored by NBC Universal. And then, as I mentioned um, earlier, the after party that we're going to go to afterwards is sponsored by Fastly. So thank you to them. Yay. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> so if you do take photos, we love it because you know, change the photos in, you know, the meetup slides, and then people can see like what's going on when they go to meetup.com slash Drupal NYC. So you can either upload it, or if you're doing stuff on so social media, just use the hashtag, um, hashtag Drupal NYC. So we've got um, a light month for upcoming events, given the holidays. Um, first up, we have Nice Camp at Open Camps. Um, and we're going to have a couple slides um, to talk about this more in detail um, right after this one. Um, around the same time, we've got Ned Camp, which is New England Drupal Camp. Um, and just want to note, in the beginning of December, there is an intro to website building with Drupal, um, in case you're interested in that. So I'm going to kick it off to Manny, who's going to talk about uh, Nice Camp. Thank you, Mike. Um, so uh, Nice Camp is happening as part of Open Camps again this year. Uh, it's three to four days. The main uh, the event is from November 17 to 20th. So that's um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. The main event is on Saturday and Sunday. Um, this time, the location is at Convene. Uh, there are two buildings, one at 237 Park and one at 730 um, 3rd Avenue. So um, we are open for session proposals. Please submit your talk to uh, this URL, 2017.nicecamp.org. We are also looking for volunteers. Please email info at nicecamp.org. And if you're interested in the open camps, there are, I think, 25 plus camps happening at the same time. Um, Angular, React, what else? Uh, DevOps, there's a whole lot of camps happening. You can check out the website, opencamps.org. 
That's it. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions about NiceCam before I go on? Okay. Thanks, Manny. All right. Um, and if you're interested in speaking um, or, you know, you can talk to any of the organizers um, tonight or you can submit to drupal.nyc slash suggest. Um, also, you can submit um, ideas for what you'd like to hear about. That's also welcome. Um, we have a Slack channel where um, I think a couple of people have popped in and in the organizer um, um, channel and said suggested some topics. So that's another way you could suggest um, topics. So we love to hear it. Um, every you know month when we're preparing, um, we're kind of taking a guess as to like what people want to learn about, and hopefully we're picking talks that like people want are, are finding great. But feedback is most most welcome. Um, do we have any? Um, people who want to talk about hiring, anyone hiring? Good job. All right. Will you stand up? Hi, my name is Adam John. Uh, looking for uh, a few people actually. Um, if full stack is is uh, an open position right now. I've I have three open headcount. One is full stack, uh, one is back end, and one is front end. So pretty much everybody here uh, could probably uh, come up to me if you're looking for something uh, to do, fun and exciting, great team. Uh, I'm involved, so these are all good things, all right? Um, Sterling Solutions. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, my name is Gergely Chomka. I'm from Chappers. Uh, we have a, a big team in, in uh, Europe, and we are building the, the U.S. team, in, and we are looking for contractors to help us consolidate, uh, consolidate our, our workload, basically. Uh, Backend and front-end Drupal developers. And if you want to know more, then talk to me afterwards. Thanks. All right, anyone else hiring? Ah, hi. <laughs> And so for hi everybody. Uh, wow, that's gonna freak loud. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Alaire. I run a company called The Verity. We are uh, in the Drupal. Um, I used to, well a lot of Drupal stuff. I've been doing Drupal for I don't know, way too long. Um, for as long as Adam probably since four X. Um, the cons the, uh, the staffing and recruiting company I run. We do full time and contract staffing in New York. A lot of people you know have been we've bumped into each other before. A lot of the stuff we're running into these days is Node, Go, Python, and a lot of DevOps type of stuff. I'm not here to like pitch positions on stuff like that, but I'll be the happy hour a little bit later on. If people want kind of a state of the union or where some things are going on or what I'm bumping into or some things that we're hearing right now, you can ask me. I mean, this is not always the answer that people want to hear, but at least I can tell you kind of what's going on out there. So I figured I'd just kind of throw that out there, and if anybody wants to, wants to chat, you can just find me. Uh, yeah, that's it. So there you go. Thanks, cool. Bye. Thank you. Did I get everybody? Oh. Thank you. I, I work for DPCI. Some of you may know my boss, Joe Bahana, who isn't here yet. But um, <clears throat> we are hiring front-end developer, Drupal themer. So if anyone is interested, you can see me. Or if I'm not here at the end of the session and Joe is here or Juzer, you can speak with them as well. Cool. All right. Um, we're just lowering the shades in the back because uh, there's some light coming through. So let's take this time to, I know you did some socializing earlier. Try and talk to somebody new. Take about five minutes, introduce yourself, meet somebody new. Um, yeah, let's do this.
All right. Sounds like there's some great conversations happening. Hopefully you can continue those at the after party at Bill's Bar and Burger. Yay! Interrupting your conversations. All right. Let's get started with our first talk from Tajina. Oh, I already messed up your name, all right, after I try to <laughs> practice. Tajinder Minhas um, on um, consuming services and DA. Um, so he's been working as a tech lead with NBC, started using Drupal back in 2010, um, and has worked like all layers of Drupal from development to theming, hosting, support, whole, the whole thing. And uh, not only just Drupal, but um, also has experience with WordPress and Zen in a variety of domains like e-commerce, education, CRM, portal, the list goes gone. Um, also has experience with integrating a variety of third-party applications with, with them. Um, he's also the architect and lead contributor of TechCud. I want to hear more about that. What is that? Um, and is currently fascinated with Python-based libraries for biometric authentication and chatbots and how Drupal can be utilized with them. Hmm. Do you want to bring your laptop up here to plug in? So let's give it up as he gets set up for our first talk of the night. So we are, um, how, first of all, uh, how many of you have actually worked in Drupal? So that would be, you know, for, for everybody. Okay, <laughs> that's nice, yeah. Sorry. Um, so uh, this is more of like, you know, hands-on experience on how you can expose content from Drupal and how you can, uh, imp you know, uh, import that content or consume that content in front end. So what I did is, uh, let me show you, you know, okay. So it's just like the basics. I just wanted to cover some text before getting deep dive into and showing my module. So that's what the web services. And uh, usually I give presentation more of interactive. So if you guys you know you know can answer my silly questions, that would be really good. You know, okay. So um, how many of you have worked with web services? I think almost everybody. Everybody. Yeah. Okay. So how you guys define web services? That's my definition. You can maybe if somebody can give an answer. Because web services are like different definitions on based on your use or based on your understanding. Anybody wanna? No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay. And um, so right now, Okay, so right now that's like from Drupal 7 there has been more talk about headless Drupal, right? So Drupal is basically being used as a uh, backend system, not as a frontend. For frontend there are like many uh, frontend frameworks which are being utilized like Angular, many of you know like Angular, React. So that's where now Drupal 7, uh, like next Drupal versions are getting into. So the first thing is there are like, there are some common terms being used in Drupal, headless Drupal, or decoupled Drupal, API first Drupal, which is Drupal 8 right now, where it is going forward to, and like a simply a smart database, more of that you have a interface where you can actually enter the content within defined forms, and then retrieve the content based on the different views, and everybody have used Drupal, so you might know the terms as well. So the basic way of exposing, con exposing content in Drupal is REST. So everybody knows here REST, right? I, I would expect, okay, so my next slide is on actually REST only. So REST is basically representational state transfer 
for me it's simply a, like simple HTTP calls to communicate between different mach machines. That's my definition. You would have like different of yours. Okay, so that's what I believe in. That rest is basically uh, you can communicate ma by making HTTP calls between different machines. And there are like different type of verbs for HTTP requests: some post, put, get, patch, delete, and you might have worked with all of these verbs. Basically, I work with like get and post majorly. That's what we use in our application. And um, so select methods are usually uh, conceived as that they are like more secure because you are not actually writing into the system. You are just getting the data out of the system. So that's basically like select methods, get, uh, post, uh, get, sorry. So this is like get is a select method and rest of like post, put, delete, patch. These are like performing any function and head is just basically seeing what this, uh, just communicating with the system with uh, actually getting zero byte. So uh, several authentication are in place for actually communicating between like before shaking hand, you have to, you know, make a non-authenticate uh, communication or you can use a authentication. So Drupal has in core as basic uh, authentication where you just pass username and password and it allows you to authenticate between each other. You can start communicating. So that's like the basic authentication. Second is Drupal REST API. So how many of you have worked with services module in Drupal 7? Uh, like most of you, that's good, yeah, okay. So uh, we in Drupal 8, we had services module. It's like a module which where you can define your endpoints and then start exposing your content using the configuration itself. Other than that, we had like, in, if you wanted to do it in custom module, we used to create hook underscore menu and define our endpoints and then with the page callback function, we used to expose our content. Where in, if you wanted to do it in JSON or if we wanted to do it in XML. So that was in Drupal 7. Now in Drupal 8, we have REST in our core. Most of you would know that if you have already worked in Drupal 8. So REST module is already in core. So these are like uh, the four basic modules which are in core, which are used for creating REST services in Drupal. So these are the REST, uh, full web service, I will show, in, show you in the configuration as well. And REST UI, UI is basically, it will show you like how many endpoints are by default available in the core. Like simple Drupal installation will give you like some endpoints, which I will show you. And then you can create your own endpoints using views and the custom module. Um, so this is what we have by default in Drupal. Like there are two methods only in Drupal where you can create REST endpoints. First is by module and second is by views. So by core, uh, these are like different entities, node, user, taxonomy, comment. You all might know all of these. So these all modules provide you different endpoints. So either get the nodes, get user, like you can perform all those verbs to these entities by default, like a single Drupal installation will give you the REST API, uh, like all the verbs for these entities. And second is you can create your own custom module to define your own logic, how to expose the content and whichever way you want to perform any function, you can create it in your own custom module. Something about Guzzle. So um, uh, how many of you have heard about Guzzle? Okay, everybody. <laughs> Okay, so um, so Guzzle is basically, you know, uh, before we used to have Drupal HTTP uh, request, we used to have a function where we used to define, instead of using like default curl, curl is basically, uh, you can make a call and then get content. So in Drupal 8 uh, community, I've introduced Guzzle. Guzzle is a PHP based client, uh, which is, you know, uh, used to make uh, HTTP calls and, uh, you know, uh, get content. So Guzzle 6.3.0 is introduced in Drupal 8.4. It has a like bit, bit different uh, um, syntax to actually query. You make a call of get, post, or delete. So this has been a new addition in Drupal 8.4. And uh, this is the syntax where you like, uh, instead of making Drupal HTTP request in Drupal 7, now in Drupal 8, you can simply create a object of HTTP client service, and then you can start making your calls. So rendering content in Twig, like that's the, uh, I'm showing only presentation right now and then I will try to, you know, show you the modules and how I've created it and what my code looks like. So uh, uh, 
everybody knows twig right if uh, yeah <laughs> i couldn't ask question right now so okay so in twig uh, these are like the syntax which you can use to perform these are you know the um, functions available to you which you can use in twig and uh, majorly like uh, i have mentioned everything which i have used and uh, uh, you used curly bracket and percentage to actually perform any function and uh, curly brackets double curly brackets to actually print any data and perform any you know if you want to perform any filter or on that content you can do it so that's all my presentation and um, i'm gonna show like how i've done it so uh, what i did is in this um, hands-on like uh, i created two drupal ins installations in my local one is like where I'm exposing content and one is where I'm consuming content. So this is where like I've created content and um, I am going to expose from the rest. So the first one is, uh, these are the modules. I'm gonna show you. So these are the modules which I was talking in my slide. These are like by default in the core and this REST UI with a, is like a contributed module which you can uh, download and install like simply the installation and then you can go in the configuration and see how many endpoints are already available. So these are all the, you know, endpoints which are already available and you can see, you know, there are like get, patch, post, put, delete for all the entities which I was talking about, like comment, node, user, and taxonomy. And these are like the, all the endpoints which are available by default in Drupal. And this one like D8 resource, which I created from out of my custom module, which I will talk more about it. And so the first is, uh, these are the, all the endpoints which are available by default in the core so you can utilize like you can call through postman or if you want if you have already a front end you can start calling it from your front end second is uh, views So what it uh, views have one more uh, uh, type now where which you can with which you can you know uh, export content. You in Drupal seven we had uh, page block or uh, attachment or uh, the other stuff, but now in Drupal eight we have rest export by default. So you can you know just create up rest expose and then start exposing your content. This is simply a get request which you can do and then you know. Um, expose your content so what I did is I just included three fields here and as you can see here these are you know uh, it has exposed the content as a JSON in a JSON format and I've just exposed only 10 content um, so I'll just show you know how you can consume it in front end that's like the other step and next is uh, by the custom module so how many of you have already created a uh, custom module in Drupal? So that's like a different, uh, you know, different way how to create custom modules in Drupal. So how many of you already tried it? Okay, so still many. <laughs> okay, so um, still, so this is like how you create con uh, um, custom module in uh, Drupal 8. And um, it's more of it's using Symfony's, uh, you know, uh, code standard. So now YML has been introduced. So if you want to expose content from uh, Drupal 8, you have, would have to create a REST plugin. And this is the structure of REST plugin. So it's like goes into source, plugin folder and REST and resource. And this is your class, which is actually exposing your content. And this is uh, where you are defining your endpoints. These are your endpoints and this is the, um, your REST endpoint name. So this is where you are defining. First one is like canonical. Uh, 
you are asking about the size. Okay. Yeah, okay, that's fine. <laughs> because I have never done it, so okay. Uh, so uh, everybody can see it because uh, like, okay. Yeah, that's Windows, your net being. Yeah, NetBeans. Uh, okay, that's NetBeans, yeah, okay. Okay, so, so this is what I was, you know, just highlighting. So this is your uh, REST resource name, and uh, you can define, you know, label it, so that you will be able to see it in REST UI. And uh, like URI paths, you can define here separately for all the verbs. So I've just defined for two here. First is my, uh, the get request, which is defined by canonical. And the second is my post request, which is HTTP www drupal.org. I don't know why they have, you know, used this whole URL. I was reading some uh, uh, articles on the drupal.org itself, but they are still working with the same URL pattern to create a REST post request in the REST plugin. So that's how you create a post request and these are the functions you can define. So it's basically a class and you can include the other classes as well to perform your logical function. So what I did here in the get is I just loaded a node here and then you know just expose it as a JSON string. So that's all what I did in this get request. And the post uh, what I did is uh, I created one table in my uh, custom module and then I am just inserting the content within my table, like custom table. So I've just exposed it. These are like my get and post uh, endpoints and these are my logical functions which I am performing within my uh, module. So you can see like if you, you know, just enable, uh, create this class and uh, enable your module, you will get your plugin you can see it here like D8 resource and then you can define how you want to expose it with the basic authentication or cookies. So you can see it like, um, how many of you, of, you, of you have used REST UI already? REST UI, like this, this interface here. Everybody have? Okay, <laughs> almost, yeah, okay. So yeah, you can, you know, define like, um, these get and post would be defined from your custom module itself that what are the canonicals or URI endpoints we have mentioned. So these are the verbs which are coming and then you can define like how you want to expose your content. So this is, you can define here itself and uh, okay. So this I defined, this is like my uh, content expose. So this is my headless Drupal and now, um, So what I did is, uh, this is my front-end Drupal where I am consuming content from my custom module. So I just created some simple tabs to show, you know, how you can do it. So this is what I did is, this is my like single node uh, where I just, uh, um, I showed you right in the get request and I just loaded one node and then uh, expose it using a get request. And here I am consuming it through my get request. I will just show you how I am consuming it in my custom module. Um, everybody know here, right? Like, <laughs> okay. So uh, um, I have just created like menu. So most of you would know like how to create a menu or route in Drupal 8. How many of you now know, right? Like it works with controller. So uh, I'm not going into how you create route using routing.yml. I'm just showing you like how, what I did in my controller. So if you want, I can show you even how to create a route. Or you want me to continue? Continue as it is, right? Or okay, fine. So, um, so these are my controllers which I have created. So first one is like first page, which is simply a simple get request, which I am making. And um, uh, so what I did is I just consumed it using Guzzle. So uh, this is like the Guzzle syntax which I just mentioned here, and this is my like endpoint which I mentioned node slash one. So I am using the core uh, Drupal endpoint right now. 
and uh, trying to get the content. And uh, this is my, uh, this is how you, you know, this provide a response to your uh, endpoint. And um, I've just included libraries. Libraries are more of that you can define your own custom CSS and custom JS. Now there's no concept of CSS and like uh, directly includes CSS and JS. You define your library and then include it in your custom module. So that's how you do it in Drupal 8 now. And uh, this is my uh, theme, uh, like my template file, which I have included. So um, how many of you know how to create, you know how you include your template files or include, define your template files. Everybody knows here, right? Using hook underscore theme, so that's same, now that's same. So that's what I have passed, like in my dollar content, I've defined my dollar data and defined here. And then you can see in my template files, how I'm, Okay, so this is my Twig template file. This is where you, uh, I was just explaining how you can, you know, print the content which have you ex which you have exposed in uh, template file itself. This this is like the devil module. It's basically for debugging. Just I wanted to show, you know, how you can debug your Twig templates either with this or either you can use, you know, the different tools which uh, are available to debug your template files. Okay, or Twig layout. So. Um, this is where I'm performing, as, a, as I mentioned in the Twig layout, my Twig slide, that uh, you can use, you know, curly bracket and percentage to perform logical functions. And these are which you can print your data and perform any, you know, the uh, filter. So these are like the by default filters which Drupal provides you, um, like this date filter, and uh, you can define as raw. The other one is D8 custom filter, which I have created on my own. Like you can diff create your own filters as well in Twig. Twig has a, uh, Twig provides you to how you can create your custom filter if you want to, because there are only 12 or 13 filters by default in Twig. And if you want to perform any, uh, you know, a modification on your data, which you are printed printing in Twig, like uh, money format, or you want to define your own filters, you can do it by creating your own filter in Twig layout. So this I will show you later. So this is like my uh, template file. This is basically what uh, I did in Twig. And let's... So that's the uh, first example of how you are making a simple get request for loading a single node. And this is how it looks in like front end. So second one is image example. What I did is I just, I created, I showed you in my Drupal 8 exposing content like headless Drupal that I'm exposing uh, in a view, like an endpoint in a view. And I just consumed, I, I again made a single um, request. So let me show you in controller. So I again just made a, you know, single um, uh, endpoint uh, request for my view. And uh, I'm just again printing whatever data is coming to me in my like using theme table, uh, that's like by default theme available to you for printing data in a table format. And uh, that's what I did in here. So this is what it's showing, oh, sorry. So this is one, sorry. <laughs> uh, so this is where uh, I'm printing my content. This is my um, views endpoint, which uh, you can see here. And um, I just passed it in my theme table. And uh, this is like the second get request which I made. The third one is uh, Drupal by default provides you, you can, you know, actually create content um, by hitting, you know, the post request, post endpoint. So uh, in front end, what I did is I just created, you know, again, a one form. And then from this form, you can actually start creating your own content within your headless Drupal. Like uh, we do it right sometimes if we are having front end and we want to, uh, create content within our Drupal backend. So this is, uh, Drupal provides you by default creating content in your system, which I showed in here. So this is what I've used like entity slash node to create my content. And um, I'll just show you what, how this request is made. So this 
So this is the form layout. Uh, if you are creating a form and in my submit handler, uh, what I did is I just created one node using a gazelle post request. So this the syntax of gazelle post request. And uh, this is where you are defining actually what type of node you are creating. So, or what kind of entity you are. Okay. So this is where you are defined like in href you have to define like with what type of node you are creating or what type of entity you are creating. So this is the syntax of using it. This is actually HAL. Um, most of you know what HAL is, right? HAL plus JSON. HAL is basically a uh, now standard for exposing your embed or links uh, as a JSON format. So this is has been introduced in 2012 and now it's being used in Drupal 8. So that's you are making your uh, making your head request and you have to authenticate without authentication you cannot create content in Drupal so this is the one uh, system which I did uh, I can create one content here So what it's doing is it's just hitting my backend Drupal, like my the other Drupal instance, and it's creating content within that Drupal. So So this is the content which I just created in my front end and this is how you can create content within Drupal making a post request. And Drupal provides you how you can create content as well as user. So that's the other part by default which is Drupal providing you. So this is like my user registration form. And this is how you can, you know, I just create a simple form in my Drupal. But there are like different configuration which you have to do before actually you, are, you can create content. Uh, in Drupal 8.4, uh, with the discussion like uh, after the 8.3, 8.4 release, now anonymous users can create content in Drupal, can create users in Drupal. So if you are making a post request before you had to authenticate, but now anonymous requests can also create users in Drupal. So that's what I have did here. Um, so either you can, you know, change your account settings and mention that, um, okay. So in your account settings, you have to define like uh, whether you want, you know, that um, user should provide you password or not. So this basically works same as we used to do. So here you can, you know, define your settings that um, um, whether the email verification should go or not. If you are defining that email verification should go, then you don't need a password from front end. So in your post request, you don't need to pass password. So these are, you know, the uh, settings which you would have to make before making a post call. So you have to define it here itself. And then uh, what I have defined here is that visitors can create content and I don't need a email verification. So that's the settings and now you can make a, you know, front end call. Uh, so this is like my user decision form. Let me define this. So now you can, you know, make a uh, post call and it will, you know, create your content with using whatever uh, information which you have entered. You can actually see that in your backend that Drupal actually creates with a post request your user. So this is just the, you know, test user which we have created and it will give you the same password which you have actually entered. So uh, this is how you can, you know, create uh, users in Drupal. I'll just show you my code. So this is the user registration. This is like the defined format which Drupal is actually asking you when you are creating and making any post call. So this is how you have to enter. So as when we are creating article, I mentioned, right, this is the href where you have to define like you are, which entity you are creating or which type of entity you are creating. So this is where you can define that you are creating your user. So these are like the different endpoints, but after these endpoints as well, you have to define like which type of user you are creating or which type of entity you are creating. So this is uh, the thing where, which you have to define, which you are creating and um, these are the fields uh, which you have to provide 
making your post request to create a user. And the last one is, um, okay, sorry. Where are, you where are you storing your tokens? Ah, okay, sorry. Um, what I did in um, Drupal 8 provides you, you know, um, before we used to have like global configs. Now we have a concept of in Drupal 8 services, which you can, you know, cre register your service and then call it, um, uh, you know, class. So let me show you my service. So this is where you can, you know, your register your service and define like what's your class name. So this is, I just created, you know, a simple class because I need it in different forms because I'm creating user as well as article and my other stuff. So I just created, you know, a service and I can call it from anywhere. I just, not this module only, I can call it from other modules as well. Um, give me five minutes, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, okay, so this, I will just show, you know, the... So this is where I'm just, you know, calling. So this is the endpoint which Drupal provides you to generate token. So before you are making, creating anything like doing, making a post request, you have to go with XC, SRF token in your headers. So this is the endpoint to generate your token in Drupal 8. And this is simple, a get request, simple get request. And um, yeah, and the last one which I wanted to show, you know, is post content. So this is basically what I did is I just created a custom uh, table within my uh, other Drupal instance and this is where I'm exposing and making a post request to fill that node. So I can, I will not show right now because we are out of time. So if anybody have any questions right now in this whole presentation. Any question? Any question? Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so this is my, you know, um, Gmail ID if you want to contact me. And um, right now I'm more of interested in uh, chatbots and uh, biometric authentication. There are like several libraries available in, available in Python. So this is like I just uh, uploaded whatever I did. I uploaded in. Uh, GitHub, if you want to download an extended module, you are welcome to do it. And this is my mail ID. If anybody is interested interested in chatbot or biometric authentication, so please contact me and drop me a mail. You know, thank you. Sweet. All right. Next up, we have John Grubb. Uh, John, why don't you come up here and get set up while I introduce you? So uh, he's been a Drupal developer since 2010 um, and has been working as a solution architect for platform.sh for the last 18 months. Uh, lately been getting to know security and compliance, application architecture, and more than a dash of Linux internal. So you're going to talk to us about some Linux stuff, right? Yay! So yeah, I'm gonna put it here. So thank you all. I put this slide deck together this afternoon. I picked the absolute most beautiful theme and keynote. Marketing's gonna be stoked with me. So uh, thank you. This is, there is no container that's not a matrix reference. This is uh, just, you'll see. So I'm John, I'm working as she just said. Uh, it's like she knows me. I'm a solutions architect at Platform SH. We are a, loosely a container-based hosting company. That's sort of like the 80 mile view. And so um, I have been getting to know what containers actually do lately. Um, what we're gonna cover are what are containers. You, I'm sure you've heard of them, uh, unless you've been living under a rock. In that case, I'm very sorry. Uh, but what are they really, as in how are they actually implemented? So we're gonna dive very briefly into some Linux nuts and bolts. Um, but what are containers really? What are we thinking about when we think about containers? Why do we care? Linux internals are kind of dry for most of us, but what do they represent as far as how we work with our, you know, how do we do our jobs? And so standard disclaimer, this one would actually be that I am not a kernel hacker, so these are fairly new concepts to me um, as just trying to, you know, learn a bit more about the in the depths of what my job entails. And so if anyone here is a kernel hacker, please feel free to shout out and correct me when I'm wrong. So 
what do containers do? Like, why do we care about them lately? So containers, in, in a nutshell, these are just sort of the four bullet points. They let us package up uh, arbitrarily complex pieces of software into a reusable little package that's easy to deploy, in theory. Uh, they can make updating software a lot easier. So if you are, you know, deploying a new change, if you're using a Drupal, you know, container, you possibly could just roll out your new release with your new code base on it, kill the old one, and uh, that's all you need to do. You don't have to worry about, um, you know, bringing servers offline or moving load balancers around, stuff like that. The really cool thing for a lot of us is that they have a lower footprint, a lower resource overhead uh, than virtual machines, which is, uh, you know, the a bit more familiar and battle-tested form of virtualization, virtual machines. And so, in theory, they are less expensive for all of us to run, and therefore we can run more of them given a, uh, you know, standard amount or a, a set amount of computing resources. Uh, but where we're going to get toward the end of this talk is they let us reason about you know, the software that we're building at a different level of abstraction. So, um, I'm sure you've seen, if you've ever been to docker.com or been to a container talk at all, somebody puts this slide up on the screen. So, what they represent, the sort of con canonical mental model of containers is just a perfect orderly world with these completely opaque boxes. They're all the exact same size and shape. We don't care what's in them. Uh, we don't need to know. We just stack them up onto our runtime and off they go. Um, we can move them around. We don't care what's inside. They're easy to perhaps update. They're easy to run. Um, but interestingly, of uh, what I found out uh, through, you know, ripping this talk off from one of my coworkers, is that uh, these container containers, the concepts that enable containers, the Linux like underpinnings of containers don't actually <clears throat> create this opacity from the outside, at, uh, outside in, but actually from the inside out. And so, from the kernel's point of view, it's not actually, uh, you know, it's not like this at all. It's actually more like this. The, the kernel's able to see everything, so these processes that are running inside your container are not actually hidden from the kernel at all. From user ID zero or init, everything up at the very top level of the kernel actually sees everything that's going on inside your container. It's your container that actually can't see out into what else is going on on that host machine. So let's talk about how to create a container if we we're gonna build one from scratch. So we got an operating system, Linux, uh, takes care of talking to the hardware and doing those things. So our program is gonna interact with this operating system via system calls, which we have probably none of us, or maybe only a very small handful of us have actually made a system call on that level. What we typically do is rely on applications. We build applications that you know, eventually translate down into machine code that tell our computer what to do and pass those system calls around. So um, in Linux, uh, so, how do we do this? C groups and namespaces, if you've done any uh, sort of investigation into how containers work, you've probably heard about C groups and namespaces. So, what does that mean? So, we've got three different ways to kick off a new process in Linux. Uh, two of them we don't care about, exec and fork, not really interested. Clone is the one that primarily enables us to do all this cool stuff. You can pass a couple of, well, actually a variety of different arguments when you call clone on some process. And by some process, I'm usually thinking about init like process number one. I want to clone init because that's the parent of all the other processes that are living on this, this machine. So, like so. This is one of my containerized applications running here. So you can see init is actually running up there at PID1. Um, and everything else is a child of that. So what we're gonna do in order to spawn a new container is call clone on init, the parent process of all processes. And what that's gonna do is create a new init with uh, that's actually a child of the original init that we cloned. Um, and we can pass some of these, you know, some various arguments to it while we're doing that. So clone new UTS. All of these start with like clone new star. So clone new UTS tells this new clone process, hey, you're gonna call set host name right when we start you, and you are gonna set the machine name for you uh, to something completely different than the host machine that you're actually running on. And in this way, Whenever somebody calls get host name on you, you are going to return your new host name. And in that way, you are going to think you're running on a completely different machine uh, or a different island from all the rest of the processes that are running on this machine. Um, you're actually not gonna be able to talk to any of those because you're going to be on your own island. Uh, so that's actually what is, what is 
termed a namespace. So anytime, uh, anytime anybody calls git host name on you, or more importantly, any of the child processes, the children processes that are spawned off of you, like PHP or MySQL, uh, those processes are gonna think they're on the island with you, and they're not gonna be able to speak to any of the other processes that are on the machine. Uh, this is the really low level stuff that uh, Docker and LXC and other container runtimes that you may have heard of take care of for you because this is obviously very low level stuff. Uh, clone new NS, NS is for namespace. This is how you sort of put, the, put a file system on your little island uh, and make it isolated from the rest of the file system so that your container has its own little file system that can't speak to the rest of the computer or the rest of the processes or files that are on the machine, clone new IPC, uh, inter-process communication, so it's only, it's, it either is or isn't able to speak to its uh, brethren on the island. Um, you can control, basically, you can lock it down to whatever degree that you want or enable processes to speak to each other as well. Isolating process IDs, isolating the network, uh, so you can give your container its own IP address, that's particularly important because we probably want to be able to pipe stuff into it. Uh, isolating user and group IDs and stuff like that. So um, in this way, we isolate the things. Uh, we also want to limit the things, however. So C groups, this is where this comes into play. C groups is the specific construct that allows you to portion out a uh, very specific amount of resources to this container or this process. Uh, this is particularly relevant for containerized hosting companies because that allows us to, in theory, um, have a greater density of customers that we're hosting on a given VM as opposed to portioning those things out with virtual machines. If you're running, uh, if you give everybody their own virtual machine, then you have the overhead of running an identical copy of, you know, Ubuntu or whatever on 100 different VMs or 10,000 different VMs, and there's just kind of a lot of waste there. Um, so not only is it helpful for making money, uh, you're also able to just to run more things on a smaller pool, and to me, as a somewhat eco-hippie that lives out in Northwest Jersey, this is pretty important because in the future, we're going to be running only more and more and more applications, so it would pay for us to be more efficient at an infrastructure level. Uh, and don't worry, we're getting there. This is, um, this is all new, very influx stuff, though. So um, containers are, a, I mean, it's a fairly new concept. That's why we've only been talking about them for a couple of years. Uh, it was not designed. It was a happy accident, sort of like PHP and some might say Drupal. Um, so uh, these things, you know, sort of by, by the democratic Linux process, a lot of these features just sort of uh, appeared in isolation and then somebody came along and figured out that we could actually stitch them in together, this concept that we now know as containers. Uh, so I think that's pretty fascinating. This wasn't, uh, this wasn't actually anybody's, any one person's idea to invent this. Uh, and as you can see, namespaces, they were, um, you know, only four years ago where they committed to the Linux kernel. So yay, just going on a very dry trip through Linux internals. What does that actually mean? So when you're thinking about all this stuff, and ideally someday we won't have to think about all this stuff, but when you're thinking about all these knobs you control, machine names, network interfaces, file system, users, permissions, etc., cetera, um, what you're actually thinking about when you're talking about containerizing a piece of software is defining or extracting the contract for that piece of software. And by contract, I mean you're defining the minimal subset of resources that it needs in order to do whatever it is you're trying to do. What is the minimal understanding of that piece of software that the runtime needs to be able to reliably run it? And so uh, Drupal, what's Drupal's contract? Like what does it need to run? It needs, at the very minimum, it needs a web server uh, either Apache or Nginx, we don't really care, it just needs a web server, it needs some way to speak TCP and HTTP to the world. Uh, a relational database, although, you know, I don't know if the Mongo module actually ever took off, but most of us are probably running MySQL. And a PHP runtime in order that your lovely code may execute somewhere. Um, what would be great if you didn't have to worry about this? Um, the, what would be the, you know, the parts you would like to not have to worry about anymore? Uh, what version of PHP is installed on this particular machine as opposed to all the rest of them? What version of MySQL is installed on this machine as opposed to all the rest of them? Where do, where do things start to creep uh, differently in relation to each other? What PHP libs are installed is the one that I need to, uh, you know, to accept, um, you know, Apple Pay requests on my site. Uh, is that particular PHP lib installed? 
<clears throat> how do you do the network plumbing between these pieces? That's fun for me, but it's not fun for everybody. So, you know, let's abstract that away. Uh, what operating system are you running? Who cares? I mean, uh, well, you know, some of us care, but it would be nice if you didn't have to. Um, is it up to date? Are the security patches applied? Are the security patches for PHP applied? And MySQL and all these other pieces of software, like these nuts and bolts sort of like non-billable things. It would be great if we didn't have to worry about those anymore. Containers can help, can help, uh, with abstracting some of these concerns. Uh, typically by specifying your contract in some sort of a config file, like a Docker file or whatever, um, that gets committed along with your application's code base. And so the infrastructure that your project or your application needs to run is actually a part of your project itself. So you define these you know, these necessary pieces to run your application along with your application. And if, depending on what your runtime is, you're just able to commit that and whatever the container runtime is, takes it from there, provisions those pieces, performs the plumbing between them, and thus, uh, you know, makes your job easier. Uh, I work for a company called Platform SH. We are a containerized hosting company and it's exactly our goal to make it easier for you to do your job by basically specifying the infrastructure you need right now, your project evolves and you need a solar server to do solar server things. You just tell us you need a solar server in a couple lines of a config file. You don't have to file a ticket. It's really great. Um, so that is the 80,000 foot view of what we do at Platform SH. And so thank you and good night. Probably. Do, do we have any questions? Yes. Uh, so you mentioned in one of your slides that uh, containers in theory allow you to save on resources in comparison to VMs. And it sounds like you're doing this on a very large scale. So what's the reality? Uh, the, the reality is actually very close to the in theory. It's just that there are caveats. Um, caveats namely like if all of your users decide to run their cron jobs at the exact same time and you've, you're only provisioned enough for maybe a quarter of them to be able to run their cron jobs at the exact same time. So it's little like uh, funny edges. If everything, you know, like I said, this is new technology. So someday we'll live in a world where these containers are able to balance themselves out onto, you know, spare resources, uh, available resources like a split second with nobody ever noticing, but we're not quite there yet. So it's really, it's the running into the, the edges of where this new technology uh, can cut you a little bit. Other questions? But isn't the whole purpose of a container to, to, to compartmentalize um, like infrastructure, right? So wouldn't that present like a fail safe mechanism for, for you know, even like even in the case of like you say multiple users running cron jobs at the same time, even if this environment falls, right, you still have uh, you still have a robust network of containers, even though if it's even if it's on the same machine, right? In theory, yes. Okay. Uh, it depends, though. <laughs> Especially like let's just continue with the example of cron jobs. Um, in Drupal, say those cron jobs are almost always going to be speaking to a database that database can get overwhelmed unless you figure out some way to partition your traffic out. Things get really tricky at that point. Um, you know, really when you start talking about distributing your database out to multiple nodes so that you can have that kind of failover capacity, you start getting into the realm of what is commonly thought of as distributed computing. And Drupal is not an application that is built for distributed computing. And so in order to be able to take an application that is not built to be distributed, and distribute it is tricky business. And so that's why, you know, like the, the end tier architecture, if you're familiar with that version of high availability architecture where you're able to scale out the web layer very easily. Um, but usually you're only relying on one database no matter how many different web servers you have running. Uh, it's, it's things like that. And so being able to crack the nut of taking in 2017 an application that was you know, thought up and designed in PHP in 2004 and being able to make it behave like you need it to behave and never screw up. That's the trick. Any other questions? 
So I, I looked into containers about a year ago for a, a Drupal project uh, where I had uh, basically a SAS for maybe about 30 to 40 clients, identical code base. Uh, and I thought, oh, this is a perfect use for containers. Uh, the file system is, is stateless. Uh, and I ended up using it for things like varnish and you know peripheral, uh, my, my HA proxy, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but it really broke down when I looked at Drupal itself because Drupal is ultimately about the database. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like if I wasn't willing to run 30 copies of MySQL, which would take more resources than just doing it without Docker, then it, I, I, it was pointless. And I was wondering if you could speak to sort of the, the Drupal-specific usage of containers. In it's not necessarily the Drupals, but I mean, you just, you pretty much summed it up right there. It's uh, the, the stateless things are a piece of cake and a natural fit for this containerized, you know, because they don't, they don't carry with them any state. If you have a new varnish configuration you want to launch, just kill the old varnish, you know, spin up your new varnish container, kill the old one, and, you know, it just works like it's supposed to. It gets tricky. Uh, when you have state involved, which is basically anytime you have a database, essentially. Um, and so that's kind of what I was, you know, that's another another uh, facet of the intricate dice that, uh, you know, he was talking about with uh, just sort of the promise of where this can go someday um, in terms of taking applications that, you know, maybe they weren't built to be distributed applications, but distribute them and make it easy to kill old ones and bring up new ones. It's, um, no, I, I actually can't comment any further than the <laughs> paragraph that I just, you know, rattled off. Your experience is exactly like what, what all of our experience has been, you know? And there are some rather exotic technologies that can kind of work around the edges of that, but there's still like, you know, new exotic technologies to, uh, to host Drupal, you know? <laughs> so thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. All right, so next up we have Ben Hartard. Um, do you wanna come up and set up while I introduce you? All right, so he's gonna be talking to us about the Square Connect module, um, Drupal Commerce. Um, he leads a software, and sorry, a solutions engineering, um, solutions engineering team, or solutions engineering, okay, sorry. He's solution engineering at Square and has spent the last four years helping Global brands integrate Square's uh, managed payment um, technology with enterprise business software. So prior to Square, he worked at Google. Um, he also led some efforts to track omnichannel marketing attribution for the top 1% of digital advertisers across retail, travel, transportation, healthcare, and CPG verticals. What does CPG stand for? It's consumer packaged goods. So you, you've come all the way out from San Fran. We're lucky to have you in the city uh, do the business. We're so happy. Let's give them a, a New York welcome. I was actually just at a bad con over in Berkeley two weeks ago, which is kind of cool. There's about 1,400 uh, attendees for Drupal conferences. It was five days long, it was pretty awesome. Uh, so thanks for having me out here. We got like a tiny screen going on here. Hopefully my battery doesn't die, I'm at 17%, so we'll make sure this goes, we'll see, we'll see how that works out. Uh, cool, so thanks for the intro. Uh, ben Harthard, I lead solutions engineering at Square. Um, and my team, we're responsible for working with our most sophisticated merchants uh, and partners on complex API integrations, technical feasibility, ideation, and pretty much leveraging Square's technology stack in their enterprise businesses. Uh, today I wanna speak about Drupal and about payments in Drupal. Uh, but I really want to change your perceptions of Square from that little white dongle, so this thing that you might be familiar with, um, and talk about our developer platform and really around payment security and, and kind of how we approach that. So let's just cut to the chase. Uh, we have an official plugin for Drupal Commerce 
we've partnered with the Commerce guys uh, on an official plugin. You can go to, uh, I guess, the, the repository or the, the Drupal Commerce repository here. Uh, you can download the plugin. It's available for, for Drupal 7 uh, as well as Drupal 8. Drupal 8's nice because it has a composer uh, installation, so it's a couple lines, super quick. Uh, Drupal 7 is a little bit more involved. Um, sometimes we go through and we actually go through an installation of these things. I don't think that will be as enjoyable, so we're just going to move right along. Uh, so let's start with Square, and let's, let's talk about a bit of context here around Square, where we came from, uh, our developer platform, and our approach to payment security, and why that's going to be interesting for you if you're building any projects that take payments. So Square started off as the little iconic white dongle, right, that you're, you're familiar with, farmers markets, small businesses, micro merchants, plug it into a mobile device, iOS or Android, and allows you to take payments securely. Um, what's unique about Square is that we build our own first party hardware. So we've moved on from the, the basic dongle for MagStripe payments, and we've now built uh, contactless and EMV readers that also plug in through, through Bluetooth to these same devices. Uh, we've manufactured our own stand solutions that accept iPads um, and that have built in you know, uh, MagStripe readers, really good aesthetics. And just this last week, we actually announced um, our new Square Register all in one point of sale. You literally buy it, plug it in, and you're taking payments in a secure way. Um, it's, it's, I think it's one of the most beautiful things. I want to start a business just to use this thing. Um, but we, we think this is kind of where the future of payments is going and how this interacts with the online world. So how this interacts with businesses that run Drupal and want to run commerce online. Um, talk about scale. So we, this is 2016 numbers, $50 billion in gross processing volume, uh, over 2 million active merchants. So this is merchants taking payments on our platform within a given month. Uh, we're seeing tremendous revenue growth year over year, and we have processing capabilities in five uh, jurisdictions now, US, Canada, Japan, Australia, and the United Kingdom, all of which have their own uh, unique ways in which you have to accept payments in a physical world. Uh, but payments is not all we do, right? So payments is the center of what we do, but ultimately we build a full ecosystem of solutions related to starting, running, uh, and growing your business, everything from a point of sale, first party hardware for accepting payments, uh, to business analytics, employee management tools, permissioning, uh, as well as capital, loans, providing funding to businesses as they grow. Uh, so this is what, you know, this is a brick and mortar solution. This is the ability to run a full point of sale, uh, to run your business at one or many locations, and you know, scanners, printers, barcodes, right, cash drawers. Uh, but it's not uncommon now, uncommon now to actually see in a traditional brick and mortar location, uh, they're ripping out these large micros, Windows-based, Linux-based terminals uh, that cost, by the way, tens of thousands of dollars a piece to deploy and operate. And they're replacing with iPads and mobile devices. And this is a location across the street from our office in San Francisco uh, that runs uh, seven terminal, so seven point of sale uh, location um, for a quick service restaurant, uh, as well as a full service dining and slash bar. And this is gonna become more and more common. And I see a lot of it already in New York uh, as I go out to different franchises and, and larger businesses beyond farmer's markets. So how I wanna change your perception and, and why this matters with Drupal projects is related to our approach to the platform. So I, I joke within all my meetings and presentations and with, and with merchants and clients is that Square accidentally built the most robust digital enterprise payments platform by starting with the most hostile of environments, small business owners. Small business owners don't know anything about security. Have you ever worked with a small business owner and deployed a Drupal project and they don't understand anything about what's going on? They don't know the difference between like their login for the computer and their login for a website or Facebook or whatever it is, right? And we said, hey, we wanna give you the ability to take credit cards on your personal device and do it in a way that you're not gonna accidentally you know, spill out this data right, across the internet. So what we did is we actually built a payments platform, right? We built an in-house, cloud-based, mobile-first payments architecture, right, for brick and mortar locations. We built our own first party point-to-point -point encrypted hardware. So we gave the farmer's market the ability to plug in hardware into their phone to take payments, but we did it in such a way that out of the box, you have point-to-point -point encryption. This is the highest grade encryption you can have that matches the highest you know, enterprise brands. And we built in into this payment stack fraud and risk uh, analytics, right? We build our own solutions to detect fraud on both the buyers and the seller side across our millions of merchants and our billions of buyers. Um, and we have you know, the most advanced machine learning algorithms, we have the most advanced technology stacks fighting for us on behalf of both those parties, right baked into that layer. 
Now, if you think about what commerce is and what you're going to build into your e-commerce solutions, it's really just a contract between a buyer and a seller with a whole bunch of data primitives, right? It's what is being sold between a buyer and a seller? What, what is the cost? What are the fees? What's in my order? Where is being sold to? Who is the employee selling it, right? What location? What device? Is it a deposit, right? It's any number of attributes. And the way we see it is what you need to enable developers to do is accept payments online, offline, brick and mortar, e-com, and really just attach these data attributes to that transaction. So it's a different way to, to, to view what e-commerce really is. And then what if you build a layer of APIs on top of that? So data APIs that can retrieve this information, but also payment APIs that allow you to attach this metadata regardless of the channel, whether it's online or offline. And then what if you build solutions? So Square, we build a first party point of sale solution for iOS and Android. Um, we use our infrastructure, our primitives, our metadata, and our APIs to enable such solutions. And we have many different marketing reporting solutions. But we're never going to be the best at everything, and we're not going to build a first party solution for everyone. So we actually rely on developers to go ahead and do that for themselves. We're not going to build a stadium ordering app. We're not going to build a medical kiosk. We're not going to build uh, SAP or NetSuite, right? But developers like yourselves will build unique solutions, you know, a unique solution for Drupal. So maybe uh, a, a retailer or a business would use Drupal in some way where they actually want to have their CMS manage payments, right? But have it flow through a unified system, right, of these primitives and of, the, of this payment stack. So where that's interesting around payments and payment security is that we actually offer two APIs that I think would interest you. And the most basic one is, is just a basic uh, e-commerce API. And this is, this is going to blow your mind here. Ready? You could build a website, and you could put a payment form on it. You could take a payment, and we'll move the funds into the bank account, right? It's, it's, it's innovative. Um, so you probably have done stuff like this before. Who here has actually taken payments through a project? And you've in integrated with a payments provider. Uh, let me guess, uh, Braintree, Stripe, PayPal, Authorize.net, CyberSource. Probably hit every single one, right? This is what this is, right? We also have a point of sale API. So what about taking physical card payments? What if you had the ability to create your own solution in a native app, iOS, Android, or in a web browser, and then take a physical card payment associated with it? And what if the solution you built here is in every way integrated with the e-commerce solution you did for card not present, where they were keying it on the website? Right? You can start kind of wrapping your mind around that. Like, what if we can merge the channels online and offline, and we can create a single set of solutions that any merchant you're, or develop, you know, project you're working with, you now have a solution for every type of payment you'd want, in person, online, offline, mobile, right? Uh, but again, we're we're more than just payments. We're an entire ecosystem for these businesses. So we have other APIs, right? Because we tie all this metadata together. So we have customer management APIs. We have items and inventory APIs, employee management, uh, sales and reporting, right? It's all of the things you'd want to run a business. And it's not just a payment anymore. It's what happens when you have the ability to build integrations with all of the attributes you would have between a commerce transaction and then share them across channels automatically. So back to Drupal, right? So we built a payments integration. We built a plugin. It, it already has all of our solution built into it. But it's just the start, because what we're going to add to this as we evolve is we're going to add deeper layers uh, of this attribution, right? We're going to add inventory support. So when you buy through the Drupal Commerce, it automatically syncs with your point of sale, right? We're going to add attribution for customers, for uh, so, you know, when a customer goes to your site, registers, buys online, they can now walk up to your physical store location, say their name, and actually use the same card on file at the point of sale from the business across the street that they actually went to the website and registered on in Drupal, right, without any lines of code beyond what you'd normally add for e-commerce. So that's, that's kind of where this all fits in. And then the, you know, the 800-pound gorilla is like, well, how are you different from Stripe? How are you different from Authorized on that? How are you different from Braintree? And the answer is we're not. We're not. We're exactly the same in every way. Uh, for e-commerce, right, it's all the same stuff. You know, uh, quick deposits, no contracts, uh, basically the same pricing. But where we differ are on these, the, the bottom line here. So it's that unified stack. It's, it's omni-channel. It's online, offline, unified solutions, right, and around PCI and security. So we, we see this all the time. We, you know, a merchant of ours, uh, in this case Little Giants, it's a streetwear brand for, for children's apparel, they start online. Think Casper, Bonobos, Warby Parker, right? We're talking about the new age digital e-commerce businesses that are all now opening brick and mortar locations, and they don't have a strategy for brick and mortar. 
And what they want is really the new age of retail, right? They want online and offline, omni-channel, single provider with the unified view of the customer. How many of you want to be able to go to a retailer online and buy something and then walk into their store and return it in a seamless fashion? Or from store, if they run out of something, you buy it and it ships from their warehouse, which is basically their online store, right? These are, these are the customer journeys you want to create and it's, it's what these businesses are asking for in payment solutions, whether it's through Drupal or, or any other provider. And security, right? Well, it's probably really complex to do these things because you have to be secure in how you do it, especially when you start taking physical cards. So there's actually a set of uh, rules and guidelines called PCI DSS certification. Uh, it's actually invented by the payments networks themselves. Uh, and it basically, it's, it's payment council, it, payment card industry data security standards. And it basically says in any way if you touch, interact, store, transmit, process credit card data, you have to abide by these rules. If you don't abide by these rules, we're gonna take away your ability to do it and you're never gonna take credit cards ever again, whether online or offline. Uh, so it turns out every other provider you use um, is different from Square. Square's different in that we're actually the merchant of record. If you go to any of the two million plus Square merchants, you're actually transacting with Square on behalf of that other merchant. And what I mean by that is that we actually sponsor the PCI compliance entirely. So if you use Square as a solution for e-com, offline, online, mobile, uh, you're not responsible as a developer, nor is the merchant ever gonna be responsible for maintaining their own PCI security scope. Uh, and by design, and we'll show you with the API, we actually design the system such that uh, the systems and the merchants do not store, process, transmit credit card withhold data, and therefore they're not actually beholden to the PCI rules. Um, so how many of you built one of these, right? It's a form, and you put the name, credit card information, and you're gonna then complete this. You're gonna submit an API request off to your favorite payments provider. Uh, and what's gonna happen is, what's gonna happen is you're actually gonna take it, and there's different means in which doing it, you can do this, but ultimately you're gonna take the form fields, you're gonna fire off the API request with that data, um, you're then gonna get a response back, and, that, and that's it. Oh no, we lost it. Anyone got a charger? <laughs> Just grab that one. We're back. All right, thanks. Uh, so in, in this scenario, though, what you're actually doing is you're putting yourself into PCI scope. And what this means is you, as a, as a developer, as a partner in the transaction, uh, you, you're transmitting now. Regardless of how long you're storing this data, it's in memory in your system, right? If you're sending this off to an API, you're now within scope and you're responsible for maintaining the, the credit card security here. Um, well, I think this, is this the same thing that was happening? All right, let's try that again. So moving on, the way it's different here, uh, e-commerce API. So if you notice actually, the only things we really care about for doing a transaction in the, in the digital world, it's really only four fields. Surprisingly, every time you put your name into a validation field on a credit card form your entire life, that, that is never validated. So FYI, you can put whatever you want there. In fact, uh, the payment card industry, there's actually no part of the scheme that accepts a credit card name to do the validation of the card. So you go ahead and try that next time you fill out a form. Uh, the only parts that are actually validated are these four fields. So we only even require these four fields. Uh, 
And what we do is we do a front-end tokenization scheme, which is similar to what some providers do, but we go a step further. So we provide you basic JavaScript, you put it onto your page, and you build placeholders on the page. So I think there's actually one other provider that does this full, uh, in, we call it dynamic iframe embedding. Um, but what you do is you define your form, you specify elements that we're actually gonna replace dynamically, you style them based on your own style, uh, and then we'll go ahead and actually, from our JavaScript, when you tell us you're ready, we'll replace those fields entirely uh, with iframes that are actually hosted on our server, uh, styled to look like your form on your own page, and you still control the form submission. So it's actually really cool. Uh, and what's great about this is you are never in contact of credit card information on your own servers, not even on the client side. In fact, there's no code you can write that when rendering this page, you will ever have access to the credit card information, removing you from PCI scope, among other things that were also the merchant of record. Uh, so, yep. So uh, address verification, they only verify what? Yeah, sorry. So the question is, what about address verification? So it's a uh, AVS support. So a credit card company wants to receive the address for which you are sh uh, shipping or billing. Usually it's for, you can only validate the billing, right, for the, the, to make sure they're the same. But they actually don't validate the whole address. They only validate the zip code. Also, fun fact. Uh, you'll learn a lot of things about it. You know, come work with us, we'll help you. Uh, so. What we're gonna do is, you know, we dynamically actually are gonna load these elements. Um, this is your page, it's your site, it's your form, you control everything, but we're gonna actually load them in as iframes, and as the user types in their, their, their private information, uh, it actually goes to our servers, and then we'll send you back a JavaScript call to your page with a nonce, and that nonce is our representation, right? It's, it's not a secret in any way. It's our representation of the secret data. Uh, you can then create a RESTful post request to us, tell us how much you want to charge, and give us that nonce back. Or you can save it on file, whatever you want to do. Uh, but this token can then be used to actually charge uh, the credit card. And then Square's, you know, as being a payments facilitator and, and uh, being a full stack solution, uh, hardware, software, settlements, we'll actually move the money directly into uh, the merchant's bank account by next business day. So next business day settlements on, this, on these transactions. Uh, and we do the same thing as all the other providers, right? So authorization and capture, customer attribution, you can add a customer to a sale, uh, do full itemization data actually on the transaction, uh, keep a card and file and do recurring payments, right? All controlled by your system. But what's happening here is all this data is being unified under the single payments platform. So if I'm a merchant that also does physical sales, I have my own point of sale, all this data is also rolling up into the point of sale. Anything from the point of sale is also available through API, visible to your integration. Uh, this is the part, that's, this one's cool. Uh, so card present payments from a web browser. It's pretty, pretty crazy. So you can do this all in one line of code. If you consider this to be one line and remove all the spaces, one line of code. Uh, all you do is redirect the browser with an href to our registered schema on the iOS or Android device. Android we do in 10, so I'll show. Uh, with a, a, a JSON payload that says, what do you want to charge? and you know, what's, what page am I coming from, where do I going to redirect it back to, what kind of tenders do I want to accept. Um, you can see the same thing in, in Android, so Android does it in tents, it's a little bit different. And these iOS and Android devices are actually built to understand this code, right, there you go, this is one line, uh, understand this code and perform an application switch on the, the device, which allows us to do some really cool stuff. Um, so you can take advantage of Square's hardware, you can accept every payment method that we accept. Uh, it syncs, again, it's the same API, so it's the same system if you take a transaction through here or through an e-commerce API. Uh, and we have a lot of things we're gonna be working on that are, are going to enable really unique experiences. And I just wanna go ahead and show this to you um, as an example here, so give me one second, let me just plug this in. So fun fact, if you didn't know, uh, if you ever wanna do a screen share, with an iOS device, uh, you can actually use QuickTime and you can say, I wanna start a new movie recording and then you can actually make your device, your locally connected device here, so. So how amazing is it that technology, right? You can now put a card reader in your pocket, just like that, uh, to take credit card payments securely. So what I have here, I'm just gonna show you, we have a square point of sale, oh, remind me later. Uh, this is a square point of sale, so I'm just loading up the square point of sale that we have. Hopefully I'm on the internet here. 
So I'm connecting an EMV reader. So it's Bluetooth connected. Hopefully it connects through here. Great. So you know we could ring up a transaction, we do whatever we want. Um, but I don't want to do that. I want to I want to build a Drupal site, right? I want to go into a web browser. I want my customer to be able to use some unique experience that I've built, but I want them to deploy it at a physical, maybe like a, like a home, um, like a real estate company, right? They use it as CMS content or something, but they want to take payments maybe for rent. So what we've done is we've built a checkout flow into that that rent system, uh, so someone can walk physically up to them and I say I'm gonna this is in cents, so I want to charge like uh, you know a dollar fifty four. Uh, and then I just want to say I want to take a payment. We're going to perform an app switch. We're going to load up the dollar fifty four. Now my reader's live. Like I could just go ahead and, in this case, I could take Apple Pay. I can do a tip if I want. And that's it. I'm all done. And now I'm going to go back into my application. We're going to see we just got a success. Here's the API response, uh, offline payment ID, right? Payment information, and we can make a RESTful call back to this to get more details. We're actually adding even more to this, so we'll start sending back the last four digits of the credit card, you know, Visa, Mastercard, whatever it may be, right in the payments response. So it means you don't even have to do the extra request, but I mean that, that's pretty cool stuff, right? The ability to from a web browser take a card payment, and we can do EMV, right? Chip cards, right? We've obfuscated all the complexity and the security there for the same level of security you would have in enterprise business, and now you could build your own web apps to do exactly that. Uh, and in case you're actually interested in doing any of this stuff, um, you can check us out on Stack Overflow uh, with the tag Square Connect. Connect is just the overarching name of our API services. Uh, Slack, we have a public Slack channel. Um, so squ.re slash Slack. Uh, you can actually register, it's just gonna be a Google Doc saying who are you, and we'll then invite you to our channel which has about you know 150 active developers kind of just chatting around. Uh, and then we also have a, a site, sellercommunity.com, and this is for any seller of any kind, of all different verticals, of all different sizes, to actually just discuss you know, what it's like to be a seller, what it's like to sell online, what it's like to sell offline, and it's a lot of small businesses, but we also have a, a part of the community here that is, are developers and are interested in uh, these types of solutions. So if you're interested and you wanna take a look at some of these and, and actually get your hands on this, so you can actually uh, sign up for an account and get hardware and get transacting in, in like minutes. Uh, if you actually go to the store too, go to Best Buy, Staples, anywhere, and with all of our hardware sold at Apple stores as well. Uh, and you can actually, again, with one line of code, uh, get integrated and try doing this. Cool, thanks. Awesome, uh, do we have questions for Ben? Yeah, I have a card present for consumers, so that's card present if you're a merchant, but you wanna make sure that the amount of fraud that's out there is just growing. So how can we make sure the person's charging actually has the card with them? So how can, uh, how can you make sure that the person charging actually has the card with them for card present? Yeah. So uh, if you were to be building this type of solution? Correct. For, so we, if you were to do an integration with us for our readers, um, so it's either this reader or this reader plugged in uh, or any of our readers, right, they're gonna connect to the device. Um, you do have an option for card not present entry. So if, if for some reason you didn't connect those readers, they could always key in, right, into that screen. No, yeah. I'm talking about the person sitting in their home, they wanna buy from your website. Yeah. Those people. So the, that, that is an acceptable behavior, right? It, in anyone buying from any website anywhere, the, the purpose is to have them key in the card information, right? It's by design, that's what we just consider to be standard e-commerce, um, and that's, that's a, a very valid use case. Anything with the hardware is meant for a merchant facing consumer interaction. But on the e-commerce side, I, I think it's, it's similar to the other providers in that we help you with that fraud piece, right? We, we're, we're looking at both the buyer and the seller side um, across those millions of merchants, applying our fraud detection algorithms, working with the networks, working with the banks to apply all that logic in real time. And again, since we're the merchant of record, it's actually in our best interest to fight the fraud on your behalf. Because at the end of the day, if, uh, if a merchant comes on, does some nefarious things, and leaves, we're the ones holding the bag for it. So our entire business model is to be the best at fraud, to, to win the market and leverage as much technology as we can to, to just fight that on your behalf. And because we, uh, I, I just wanna compare this, is that some companies are built for developers, 
I think Stripe, like they're built for developers and I, I think they've done the best job ever in, in doing that as a company. Square is built for merchants. So we're now working with developers, but ultimately every tool we build is for merchants to grow their business. And in that case, we purposely build things with simplicity in mind. Literally, just give us four fields and we'll, we'll tell you whether or not it works or not, right? So simplicity and security, those are our, our main concerns. And when it comes to fraud, like it's all just kind of baked right in. So I was wondering, because I like work with payments a lot through Stripe and uh, just look at payment information a lot, uh, why is the, when we take the nonce, we can store that and then that's PCI, we can store that in our database and that's safe? Yeah, so the, the nonce itself is actually short-lived. It has a life of like hours. It's, it's meant to be consumed. Uh, so to consume it, you have two options. You can either charge it right then and there, right? or you can convert it into a long-lived token. In this case, it's a customer card token, and that absolutely can be stored into a database. So um, a representation of credit card information is not under PCI scope. If someone were to hack into your database and they see a bunch of non you know, tokens that represent cards, it means nothing to them because it's scoped to your account in Square behind our levels of security, right? There's nothing they could do with that data. They might be able to charge against it in, in using your own credentials, right, on your behalf to put it into your bank account, it doesn't really help them, right? Um, so it's not, it's not scope data. So by design, anything you use in our system, anything you touch at all, is completely outside PCI scope. Um, are there any industries that you don't work with? I mean, obviously legal industries, but things that Apple Pay won't, for example, work with. Uh, so, in terms of like just because we don't, we don't as a business want to work with them. Um, yeah. So the illegal, the illegal ones, right? Uh, anything that's related to gambling or this or that. Um, we we also don't work with firearms um, companies. It's not illegal. Uh, we just don't do it. Um, we actually have a list on our site uh, that would include a full listing of all these. We're, we're very transparent in everything we do, including who we will and will not work with. Um, and we oftentimes have to proactively go in and remove such parties from our system. Um, I will say is that, again, we're, our philosophy is that we're, we're for merchants, right? We believe there's actually on the wall, right next to my desk in the office, it, there's a, a phrase, economic empowerment. And that is like the purpose of our company, right? That is what everything we do and every decision we make is, is aligned with. And we believe that there are a lot of businesses who historically have not been able to accept credit cards, accept payments, because of their business and industry. And we don't necessarily think that should be the case. So there are certain industries out there, uh, up and coming industries, that we really want to enable that certain jurisdictions, like the United States, don't allow. Um, but we're doing everything we can to, to start making headway there. Great. So I was just wondering if there was like another um, platform that you guys have where developers are like really leveraging Square to uh, like build or offer services to like third party merchants. So like for example, um, I know that Shopify, a lot of people use, like a lot of developers use Stripe in their apps that people can install in their Shopify stores to like add additional functionality. And I was wondering if that's like something that's going on. So, do you mean more like a, um, so Shopify also has an amazing developer community, right? So they have an entire part of their, their site devoted to finding resources and developers that work with Shopify and specialize with Shopify to help merchants or other developers hire you to, to work with their platform. Um, so, and then the second being like, how do you work maybe with Shopify or something? But like, so we, we're just starting. So our developer solutions here, what you're seeing here, Officially launched March 30th, 2016. Year and a half, right? So we're, we're brand new. We're an, an eight-year-old company with a year and a half old API platform that we just opened up. Um, we are, over the next two years, going to be pushing very hard uh, to, to create awareness and create developer communities within our platform, right? We're gonna get, um, we get inbound requests all the time saying, hey, do you have recommendations on who I can work with? I have Drupal. 
do you have Drupal developers that you can recommend? And the answer is, today we don't. But we want to, right? We, I want to be able to turn around and say, yep, actually, these are the three best in New York, local to you. And I want to recommend them, right? That's what we want to do. Uh, and I would say maybe in like 12 to 18 months, we're going to really start pushing that initiative. So if anyone's interested in that kind of stuff, let me know. Um, and then there's just the, the platforms themselves, limitations. So Shopify, uh, they actually have their own payment solution. And Shopify is a closed platform, unlike Drupal, right? So Shopify will just say, we don't want Square. But all the other, you know, Drupal, OpenCart, uh, even like BigCommerce, Weebly, right? These e-commerce, all of them open arms, right? And we have official partnerships with, with pretty much all of the open source and uh, Magento, right? Open source solutions as well as some private platforms. What's the uh, the main pl like platform of Square? What is that programmed in? The main platform, just like our, our APIs. Uh, like where I guess the payment processing and stuff like that. So. Uh, so so we offer our own first party website that has like payments built in. Um, but our, our approach is that every single platform we want to have Square as a solution for. We actually want to invest more in, if you use Drupal, we want to make it an option for you in Drupal, right, as a plugin. If you use Magento, if you use all the other platform providers, we just want to be an option and available for when you want an online presence. Because what we do is, it's not just online, right? What we're, it's that whole omni-channel experience. It's online and offline. And we just want, we want all of it. We want to, any merchant, whether you're selling online, offline, mobile, pop-up, on the beach, in the store, like, we want to give you the tools where you can use one provider for all of those, and you can pick and choose who you hire to do an integration, whether it's us, whether it's a third party, whether it's an online platform, whether it's Drupal, whether, you know, that, we want to enable that kind of choice. Well, yeah, I was just going to ask you about cross-border. Oh yeah, so what's interesting about that is it, I, I remember even when like Stripe first started, everyone's like, why can't I do certain things? And, and the answer is countries just don't allow it. Um, there's actually really strict regulation around um, how you can be a merchant somewhere, how you can accept funds. And even in Square, you, when you're a merchant in the US, you have to be physically in the US. You can't go to Canada and take a payment. Uh, and this is physical card payments, right? When you're a merchant in the US, you can accept payments from anywhere in the world. That's totally fine as, you know, card not present or someone physically comes to you. You know, e-com, right? US merchant, cards around the world, that's totally fine. But in terms of moving funds across borders, you have to physically be located there to take the payment. To take the payment. Um, and then there's a lot having to do with, like, currency as well. Um, Right, and that's for accepting payments. So the, the issue is usually related to um, you wanting to receive the money. That's where a lot of the regulation comes in. So is your question more of like, how can I, can I accept payments from around the world? The answer is yes, absolutely. Anyone in any jurisdiction that we accept can accept payments from anyone in the world. Um, another fun fact, only three countries in the world do zip code or AVS verification. US, Canada, and the UK. No one else. So if you're taking payment from someone from somewhere in Eastern Europe or somewhere in Asia, uh, their credit cards actually don't have address verification on it. So you actually have to rely on the, the payments platform uh, to, to provide you advanced fraud and risk to, to help you stop fraud before it happens because you can't rely on the credit card networks. Um, but yeah, receiving funds, not a problem. It's when you, sorry, accepting funds from buyers, not a problem. It's when you are a merchant that actually wants to be in different locales or operate internationally or be a, a international business, that's where it gets into a lot of complexity. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ben. Are you, are you going to be around for um, the after party? All right. Well, um, if folks have more questions, um, maybe we can uh, chat with you up. All right, so let me introduce the last talk. Oh, thanks, sorry, I did it, sorry. Last talk, we've got um, John Goldberg talking about um, Civi CRM. Um, so while I introduce you, you can get set up. So uh, John is a former political organizer and a nonprofit IT drone <laughs> turned web developer. Been working with Drupal since 2007, Civi CRM since uh, 2010. Um, outside of work, 
Uh, junk can be found engaging in queer community organizing, uh, dissembling electronics, and training parrots. So interesting. Um, so let me get you set up here. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I guess uh, to get started, can I just get a show of hands? Who here has heard of Civi CRM? Who here knows what I'm talking about? Ooh, not bad, okay. Um, so, uh, sorry, let me, uh, there we go. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, today, uh, uh, Joe asked me to talk about Civi CRM and the state of Civi CRM with Drupal. Uh, I'm going to go through three things uh, because we're a little short on time. I'm going to skip this comparison here. But uh, I'm going to do a quick uh, what is Civi, um, how, what are its integration points with the rest of Drupal, and then talk a little bit about D8. So for the folks who didn't raise their hands just now, uh, Civi CRM is a CRM, and CRM stands for uh, Customer Relationship Management, or if you don't deal with customers, Constituent Relationship Management. It's that Rolodex on steroids that tracks all of your contacts and all of your interactions with them. Your phone calls, your meetings, your emails, and uh, Salesforce is the is the you know the 600 pound gorilla in the room, uh, and it, CRMs are most often used by sales teams to say you know, show me all my customers in the Pacific Northwest who have bought, you know, $100,000 worth of widgets in the last 18 months. Uh, Civi CRM is a little different. Uh, Civi CRM is aimed at uh, nonprofits and other non-commercial entities. Uh, so the whole sales component of CRM is out the window. Uh, nonprofits are more inter interested in, your, in their interactions with you, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, it's competing with tools like Salesforce, but also sort of traditional uh, nonprofit and association management software like Razor's Edge, IMIS, Nation Builder. Uh, another difference is that Civi CRM is open source and it's self hosted. Um, I get the question sometimes uh, in Drupal rooms is Civi CRM a Drupal module? And I kind of have to give that sort of shrug guy emotion, um, emoji, uh, because it's, it's, um, yeah, kind of. It installs as it installs as a module. We'll get a little bit more into why I I sort of qualify that. Um, but you know, for for most purposes, the answer is yes. Um, so what Civi CRM does? Uh, so there's the two points right up at the top. that are sort of the basic ones where you're just collecting information about your contacts and your information um, and your interactions with them. Uh, but when I talk to somebody about Civi CRM who might want to use it, what I say is it does donor management. It's your event registration system. It'll do your mass communications. It can do case management, membership management, volunteer management. Uh, there's a couple other things it does that uh, are, are smaller points that I'm not going to get into here. Uh, you know, very quickly, we're talking about things like online petitions, uh, get out the vote reporting, stuff like that. Um, and then who uses Civi CRM? It's actually uh, quite a large uh, sort of, I, I think of it as this nonprofit software, and there are nonprofits that use it certainly. Um, but you can see that there's, there's a bunch of other uh, entities like governments, political campaigns, religious entities, uh, and who, who all have found their, their use for it. Uh, I tried to give sort of New York local examples here so that folks might, uh, say, oh yeah, you know, I, I work with that organization. Um, and I'm gonna, uh, I'm very, gonna very quickly go to um, a quick live demo now. Uh, it's just gonna show you what we're, you know, what this looks like so you all know what we're talking about as I move through it. Um, and then I'm gonna jump into a little bit of under the hood and then the integrations. So, sorry, I'm, 
I'm going to close that. Uh, oh, I brought this up because I wanted to show my parrot, but oh well, I'll save that for the end. Um, I'm so sorry, I don't have this on my screen. Okay, so um, this this is this is this is what Civi CRM looks like. Um, if folks have used Civi CRM before and maybe even installed it yesterday and says it doesn't look anything like this for me, um, that's because I've got an alpha version of the new theming system installed. Uh, and so uh, if you install Civi CRM right now, it's kind of got that like 2010 look to it. Um, the um, this 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 new theme is bootstrap enabled and is you know all the, all the things we love. It's responsive, blah blah blah. Um, it's about two thirds done. It's it's going to be available generally. Uh, I was told it'll release around Christmas, which probably means uh, the February release. Um, I'm, I'm not even I'm not even trying to be clever about deadlines there. It's just the it's that's just the release cycle. <laughs> um, so you can see that right off the bat, I'm looking at a contact. This person's name is Bob Jones. I can see basic contact information about them. I can click on any of these items. Psych, what's going on? Um, I could click on any of these items and get this sort of Ajaxified uh, way to enter information about them. I can also go, there's a contributions tab. I can see this, this person's made one contribution to us. Uh, three activities. It looks like uh, they made the contribution, which also shows up in the activity feed. Uh, they also sent out two telefriend notifications, probably based off of that uh, contribution, except it's you know it's fake data, so not really. Um, and I can see the relationships to other contacts in the database. Those might be individuals, households, organizations, uh, and of course I could put these people into groups based on my search criteria. I can do reporting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one cool thing is because it installs as a Drupal module, all of your public facing pages are going to inherit the theme. And so you can see here that this is, oh no, sorry, this is a different thing that I'll show you in a minute. Um, so this is, this is a, a live donation page from uh, an organization I worked with a while ago. Uh, sorry, I don't take responsibility for the CSS here. I was not responsible. Um, but, but you can see that it's inheriting their theme. If I go to another page, um, you'll you'll see that um, I, I'm I'm still I'm still people are still on that site and they get that feeling that they're still on the same site so they get uh, that that um, that feeling that they belong there that reduces the abandonment rate uh, which is typically 50 to 70 percent on donation pages uh, and just here's a, another example here's another this is a very small organization I think they've got three staff very low budget it kind of feels that way but it's you know it's but the point is that it's, it, it's inherited the, uh, the theme from Drupal. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to show uh, very quickly was that um, a cool thing that's come out from CiviCRM recently is uh, an overhaul of the mass mailing uh, functionality. Until now, if you wanted to do a mass email in an open source tool, you're probably constructing that email template in something like uh, CK Editor or TinyMCE. And that experience sucks compared to using MailChimp or Constant Contact. Uh, and uh, there's, there's, there was a MailChimp competitor that open sourced their template builder um, out in Italy. I don't know if it's because they got out of the business or what, but um, CiviCRM is actually the, uh, the first major open source project to build the template editor in. And so, um, if, so, so it's actually got this really great um, this, this, this block-based system, which if you've ever built one of these tools, uh, or sorry, if you've ever built an email in one of these tools, uh, you know that it's, you know, it's kind of great to be able to just sort of pick things and then, you know, oh, I actually don't have any images on here because this is my laptop, I don't use this machine. I put in an image earlier. Uh, but, you know, you can, you can, you can screw around with, with, the, with the settings and change it up and change the text very easily, uh, but, Crucially, unlike CK Editor or TinyMCE, um, your end user, uh, you know, communications intern is not going to uh, insert a table to put in an extra image and then screw up those uh, those emails on Outlook or or mobile, etc. Um, so that's that's the the very quick. Um, this is what this system looks like, and now we're going to skip back to the slides. Uh, 
it doesn't want to, it, it still thinks on this system that I'm in the slides is the problem. Uh, sorry, let me see if I could end and restart the, uh, the slideshow. My apologies for the, the technical problems. There we go, great. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, Civi CRM under the hood. Um, it installs as a Drupal module, like I said, and like most Drupal modules, it expects Drupal to handle the Drupal things. User management, permissions, et cetera, um, the theme are all coming from Drupal. Um, but unlike Drupal, or sorry, unlike most other modules, you can also install Civi CRM on other CMSs. Uh, it supports uh, WordPress, Joomla, and Backdrop. Uh, and the reason is that the code is about 98% self-contained, and then the last 2% handles the integration portion. Um, that said, um, Drupal was the original CMS that uh, Civi CRM installed under, and the vast majority of the folks who come to the Civi CRM development community come from the Drupal dev community. And so you see a lot of things come from Drupal. Little things, like the code style guide for Civi CRM is the Drupal style guide. But also things like the hook system, the extensions ecosystem, which mirrors the modules in Drupal. Um, all are very familiar if you're, if you're, used, if you're used to using uh, Drupal. Uh, you can see from this little graph here, this, you probably can't see the, the numbers or the, the words. But that big blue part of the pie is, is Drupal installations compared to other CMSs. Um, uh, a lot of the components under the hood, uh, Symfony is used by both. Uh, the Symfony Events Dispatcher is used by both D8 and by Civi. Um, it feels a little bit like D7 and a little bit like D8. Um, and, and that's kind of a good representation of, of where it's at. Um, besides that, um, a lot of the power, a lot of the reasons that people use Civi specifically with Drupal um, is because you get these, these super tight integrations. Um, and you get a tighter integration. Basically, you've got three choices in the, in the CRM world. You can go with a third-party tool um, like so Salesforce or some other off-site hosted tool, in which case you're communicating via API Maybe you're doing some syncing back and forth, um, or you're building something in uh, in the Drupal uh, native CRM tools like Drupal CRM, uh, Red Hat, etc. Um, and both of those have their trade-offs, and Civi sort of manages to thread the needle and get what I think is the best of both worlds. Um, because the data is generally hosted on the same server, um, in sometimes even the same database as Drupal. Um, you get things like like really easy um, really in easy integration for views. You can any any entity that is available in Civi CRM is available for views. Uh, web form integration is super tight and super cool. I might actually, if we have a minute at the end, demo that because it's 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 just really cool. Uh, there's rules integration. Um, the really killer feature I find is Civi CRM entity though. Um, this makes all of your CRM entities fieldable Drupal entities. And so you can start building things that are almost um, headless Civi in Drupal. Um, there's a good, uh, there's, a sh there's a shop out in Texas that built uh, a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising site for the University of Wisconsin. Uh, all the students get their student activity fees that they can then allocate to the organizations that they want to support. And they built a site to do this. And it was great because they were able to build it all using Drupal web portals and using views and web form to do some very sophisticated looking things, but it was all backed by a pre-built CRM. Um, there's, there's, really, um, there's really no other non-Drupal CRM tool that comes, that, 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 that can really do that. Uh, sometimes you get things like the Salesforce module that does that by, uh, by faking it, by creating entities in Drupal and then syncing the data. Um, but then you get into two-way data sync, and uh, if anybody here has ever done two-way data sync implementations, you, you, you all know what the, what the pitfalls are there and why that's a little bit tricky. There's lesser integrations. I'm not going to get into them. You can read them up here. Um, I think of these as being the lesser integrations mostly because these are the things that you can get um, from, from pretty much any uh, CRM integration with Drupal. Uh, and, and as a 
as a result, I don't think of them as being particularly uh, special. Uh, we're going to skip over this. I guess you can read it in the 10 seconds. I'll leave it up. Um, that David, David Snopek's um, blog post actually is really great, and I actually link to it later, so you can grab that. Um, and then finally, I want to talk about uh, D8 and Civi CRM. Uh, so to give a quick disclaimer, I'm not really a D8 dev. Uh, and so when, and, and I haven't worked at all on the D8 integration for Civi. So I went to all the D8 uh, Civi experts and I said, well, you know, what should I say? And the first thing everybody said is, you've got to shout out this other person. Um, the names are up here. Um, I'll probably name them off uh, as we get into the things that they're doing. Um, but in particular, I wanted to, lots of people said, shout out Google Summer of Code. Uh, Civi Serum has been a Google Summer of Code project for several years, and they've been a, a big supporter. And this, the D8 integration was actually one of the bigger uh, wins there, uh, because it was one student working over a summer in undergrad and managed to pop out a, uh, an alpha. And, uh, and that alpha goes to the first bullet point up here of where are we right now. Um, that, was, that was two years ago. And at the time, D8 integration with Civi was working great. It was perfect. It was super quick to, to do. Um, and, then, and then the goalposts moved. Um, Drupal went to a newer version of Symfony. Uh, Civi did not go to a newer version of Symfony because at the moment, uh, Civi still wants to support uh, uh, PHP 5.3 users through the end of the year. Uh, and so how do you deal with the, uh, the shared libraries? Well, now you've got to install Civi via Composer. Civi uses Composer, but it's not installed via Composer. Um, and so up until somebody dealt with that, the D8 uh, integration was broken. Um, but fortunately, uh, David Snopek, again, stepped up and handled this. Uh, he just sort of took a weekend and cracked the nut. And, uh, and so now we're, we're back again, and we're, we're up and running. It's a little bit tricky. Um, and, and sorry, this blog post here um, gives, gives the instructions, and basically you've got it. The, it took me about five minutes once I had a D8 installation up and running, but it was... It's it's not it's not ready to just hand off to uh you know to somebody who can install install a, a regular module yet. Um, but post install, it works, um, which is super exciting. If you are a, a shop that has dealt with Civi before, or maybe you have uh, maybe you're not in a shop, maybe you work for NBC, but you get roped into working for that little nonprofit you support, uh, or you're on their board. Um, and you want to do the D8 Civi thing, you can do it. Um, there are some bugs that are showstoppers for preventing release. Um, I'm listing them up here. Um, I, I think that these things are things that are going to get resolved very quickly. Uh, the number of bugs that have been fixed since I was asked to do this presentation six weeks ago or four weeks ago uh, has dropped the list. This was, this was going to be a, a different sort of a slide. And it really got down to like some very small bugs. Um, it, it, it really feels very much usable if you're familiar with Civi. Um, once that's done, and uh, you know, when I was being talked into doing this presentation, I was like, why do they care? It's not released yet. And and, and Joe Bacano was like, well, you know, maybe some of these folks, they, you know, they want to figure out how to get involved. Uh, the one thing that's really not left to, to do, so uh, is, is, is to deal with this, um, is the integration points. Uh, Civi CRM Entity, uh, there was a decision to move Civi CRM Entity into, into Civi CRM Core. Uh, and the reason for this is that the views and rules integration was, part, was previously part of Civi CRM Core. And now that Civi CRM Entity has matured, we can actually implement that and get views and rules and much more for free just by virtue of having the Entity API. Uh, then there's porting Webform Civi CRM. Uh, Webform Civi CRM is pretty amazing, even compared to some other Webform CRM integrations. Uh, I saw Jake Rockowitz earlier. Um, I know that uh, Jake has uh, already very kindly given his time to have a couple of calls with the Webform Civi CRM folks, uh, probably Coleman and uh, Karen, with Karen, who is uh, leading the Webform Civi CRM charge. Uh, fortunately, the Civi CRM community is super uh, friendly and tight, 
and if Karen says, and Karen says I'm gonna start fundraising for this soon, and it's not uncommon for other Civi CRM shops to start pitching in, and Civi Volunteer got $25,000 just from other shops to, uh, to release a new version. So I, th I think it's pretty doable to get uh, a full-time person on this once, once things get rolling. If folks wanna jump on though, that's great. There's also some other minor integration points to handle. And if you do wanna get involved, uh, you can go to issues.civicrm.org and search by the Drupal 8 tag. Uh, do be sure to install the master branch. Uh, I saw something merge just today that got fixed. Um, and other than that, uh, there's a couple of developer resources up here. Uh, the docs just got a complete overhaul, so they're not suffering from that doc bit rot that most projects do, at least for the next six months. Um, you could also jump on, there's a stack exchange uh, specifically for Civi CRM, and we have Mattermost. Any other questions, uh, feel free to tell me, and uh, you can contact me here, and I'll take questions while I find that parrot picture. Questions for John? I have one. Um, there recently, um, Drupal 8.4 has been released, and the uh, back office has been drastically changing. Uh, it changes from Symphony Components 2.7 to 3.2. Does that affect the integration with CD CRM? Uh, no, because uh, we're using Composer to manage the uh, the having two versions of Symphony being loaded, basically. Uh, it, it, it did until that that David Snowpick installation point. That's that's why the early alphas don't work anymore. John, I had a question uh, actually about the uh, the new mail uh, templating system. Can we? Uh, does it actually allow for searching for content within Drupal, or is it really whatever's in your desktop or whatever you're writing through that form or that interface? That's a really good question. Um, so the way that that's handled both in sort of classic Civi mail and in the modern Civi mail is through using tokens, uh, basically mail merge tokens. Uh, you can use a mail merge token that pulls Drupal data. Um, and there are some good examples of that uh, that people are using today. Those tokens will work um, independent of your email template builder. No problem. Thank you. All right, so we're just gonna wrap up. Um, we have our next meetup December 6th, again. Please reach out to um, about what you want to learn about or if you want to present. And this is where we're going. We're going to Bill's Bar and Burger on 51st Street. Uh, again, it's sponsored by Fastly. Um, and hope to see you there. Thanks, all. <laughs>